welcome to our February wrap up. February was a really great month for us reading wise. We ended up reading 16 books. We weren't aiming to read quite that many, but we managed to. Didn't quite get our entire TBR finished, we are about halfway through The Vanishing Half at the moment so it will be one of the first books that we finish in March. This is the first video I'm filming after having my dentist surgery so I'm gonna try and keep it as brief as possible but I do also have 10 books to talk to you about so this might might get a bit kind of slurred towards the end depending on how my mouth is feeling and I do have one DNF to talk to you about as well. First of all I'll give you our reading stats for the month. So in February we were aiming to read 3,850 pages and we ended up reading 5,351. Which is a lot more, that's like 1,501 pages more. It ended up being 138%, which I think since I started doing reading stats and actually looking at the percentages of what we were aiming to read compared to what we actually read, I think that's the highest percentage that we've gotten. So I'm pretty chuffed with that, especially seeing as we didn't think we'd be able to read as many because not only is February the shortest month, but with the, the dental surgery as well, uh, we didn't think we'd be able to get that much done. So that's exciting. I'll just give you the star breakdowns quickly. So we have one five star book, one four and a half star book, seven four star books, five three star books, one two and a half star and one two star as well as one DNF. So it's a lot towards the, the higher spectrum which is good. Trying to DNF more books in 2021 if they are boring me and I've managed to do that again. I have one DNF in January, one DNF now so that's a good sign. Yeah so pretty happy overall especially because we did get our first five star in this month. I had given Gemina from J. Christoph and Amy Kaufman four and a half stars and I did give Obsidio four stars when I did my mid-month wrap up but I've since re-evaluated and I've bumped them down to four and three stars respectively so it's kind of skewed things a bit from when we did our mid-month wrap up but we have a full series review of the Illuminae files going up at some point that will give you some more information as to why I decided to change my ratings. But yeah, without further ado, let's get on with talking about the books that we read. First book I finished in the second half of the month was It's Sounded Better In My Head by Nina Kerwood. Uh, this is Nina Kerwood's debut novel and it's also an Australian YA. It's about a girl who has suffered with terrible acne for her entire teenage life and it's given her a lot of confidence issues, it's made her very self-conscious and it's meant that her romantic life hasn't really taken off and she ends up developing feelings for her best friend's brother which I know is a bit of a cliche but I think that the way that N Nina Kerwood writes it is actually quite fresh and interesting because Alex is very different to his brother and not only that but his brother and their other best friend Lucy are in a relationship together so there's that dynamic as well of like her being the third wheel and then developing feelings for this guy who's completely different to the guy that she thought she was supposed to like so that's an interesting one. This is one that's described as a comedy and is actually really funny which is brilliant. Uh, I often find that if there's a way that's described as funny I just deadpan facial expression don't even crack a smile through the whole thing. Uh, it takes a lot to get the right sense of humour for me in YA especially in like writing. Um, I think it's different when you're watching shows, it's easier to get a laugh out of me, but books especially, I always find it hard to have that kind of comedy value in them. But this one I laughed out loud at quite a few points, and I read it by myself, but I kept reading quotes out to Sean to say like, oh well, yeah, like this was a really funny quote, I think you'd enjoy it. Um, so it's definitely a book that I would recommend, and this one got four stars. Uh, the only reason I didn't give it five stars was because it didn't really have much of a plot. Like, she likes the boy, and she's experiencing the summer while she's waiting for her exam results and waiting to find out where she's going for university but not all that much happens it's very very short i think if it was a bit longer and a bit more fleshed out it would have been a five star for me but i am looking forward to reading more of nina kerwood's writing in the future the next book that we finished in the second half of february was concrete rose by angie thomas this was another four star for us um so this follows star's father maverick as he discovers that he is a father and comes to terms with the way that being a dad changes his life. I didn't find this one as impactful as The Hate You Give. If you didn't know, Concrete Rose is the prequel to The Hate You Give. I've mentioned that basically every time I mention this, which is why I just pass that over. But it's just, it's not as impactful. I don't know if that's because it's a lot shorter. 
or if it's because it's so intensely focused on the way the Maverick comes to terms with being a dad and also comes to terms with losing his cousin, who is sadly killed in this novel. But I don't know, there was just something about it that I didn't like as much as Angie's other novels and I'm still struggling to put my finger on what it exactly was. I liked the writing style more. So this is written in a very informal way. Um, I think that it would be described as um, African American vernacular English. At least it, it feels like that. It's been a long time since I've studied English so I'm not quite sure if I'm using the term correctly at this point. But it's written the way that Maverick would say it. So you do get a very very strong sense of voice throughout this story. Um, but because I was reading it out loud I did find that a bit hard to come to get my head around to start with um but i liked the fact that, that was a challenge and i liked how vibrant it made maverick he definitely like comes alive on the page in this story and i already really liked his character in the hate you give i just kind of wish this one a bit a bit longer because it feels like there's still more story to be told at the end of this book i'm trying not to give spoilers because something in it that i didn't realize was going to be included in this um it's quite a big part of the story but it feels like if that had been focused on a bit more if this had been like 100 pages longer it probably would have been a five star for me but it feels like it ends at a very strange point um but i did still really enjoy it and i still love angie thomas's writing and i was glad that we got to see a bit more of maverick in his younger years the next book that we finished in February was Memento by Amy Kaufman and Jay Kristoff. This was our 4.5 star for this month. This was the entire reason that I reevaluated my ratings for Gemina and Obsidio because Memento is better than Gemina, but it's not as good as Illuminate. And that was what made me think like, Gemina's not a 4.5 star if there's something that can be this much better than it that still isn't quite at Illuminate's level. So I kind of reevaluated it all. As I said, we will have a full series review going up at some point, so I won't talk about this one too much. But this is a short story that is b set before Illuminae, and it kind of explains how Aiden, which is the computer AI in Illuminae, how he gets his independence and kind of gets his own personality. Because that's a big part of the story, is that he gets damaged and he becomes a character in his own right even though he is this artificial intelligence but this explains the kind of groundwork that gave him the potential for that damage to spark this personality and I think it's fascinating this gave me so much emotion this gave me so many feels and I loved the characters that were in it even though this is like 75 pages I think um but I loved the characters that were in it and I loved the story so much and it was just what I wanted the rest of the series to be. Um, I wanted to have that powerful feeling towards these characters and um, I think it's Olivia is her name. She really does elicit so much emotion from you in such a short amount of pages. So yeah, definitely my second favourite book in the Illuminae Files series. The next book I'd like to talk about that we finished in February was Matched by Ali Condi. This is the first book in the Matched trilogy and... I gave this one two and a half stars, but there were points when I thought I was going to give it higher. Um, so this is a dystopian and it's, uh, I think it's America in the future, it's probably America, most of them are. But there's a girl called Cassia and in this world the society determines everything. Um, so they've chosen a hundred pieces of music, a hundred books, a hundred paintings, uh, like the best of the best, the creme de la creme of human achievement and those are the only things that are allowed now there was too much choice and that was the reason that the world ended as we know it and so the society think oh well it was obviously because there was too much choice that's why all this bad stuff happened so we're gonna dictate it so the everybody has like a vote and then we pick 100 best things and that's all there is now they have to wear plain clothes so they can only wear this one set of clothes they're very neutral colors all the time apart from when they go to their matched ball so when this book starts cassia is about to get matched, and that means that she's going to be told who her soulmate is and who she will spend the rest of her life with and who the society have determined that she is the perfect fit for genetically and environmentally so that they can have amazing children and the human race will carry on as it is now like perfect 
But Cassia, the day after her match ball, they get given like a little memory card so that they can see everything about the person they've been matched with. And she plugs it in and somebody else's face shows up on the screen. And it's something that she knows. And she's like, ooh, that's a bit weird. Why is Kai on my screen? But then, yeah, she is obviously interested in him because he's randomly turned up. The society's people, I can't remember what their exact name is, uh, they come and they're like, hey, uh, that was a mistake, that was a prank. Somebody was paying on a prank, uh, Kai, Kai Imp for you. And Cassia's like, hmm, fuck, me likey. And I think I loved the idea of the society and it's been a long time since I've read a dystopian which is just such a classic dystopian. Like, this is a product of its time definitely but it's kind of a guilty pleasure for me because I read like Divergent and I really enjoyed it but I haven't like on rereading it it's not as impactful but I haven't experienced a dystopian for the first time for a very long time so part of me was like oh I really really like this it's a very quick read and yeah it's just it's very comforting as somebody who grew up reading dystopians but then I just think like I've seen most of this before um, the insta-love is off-putting. I should have expected the insta-love because it's literally called matched and it's all like being matched up with someone. But I think the relationship feels like it's going to be a slow burn. She's like, oh, I can never touch him because he isn't the one for me. Oh, we're going to have long lingering glances across the field while we hike. And then all of a sudden she's like, I've loved you since the day I met you. Wow, okay, that came out of nowhere, but alright. And I think that if Ali Condi had actually made it more of a slow burn, like, because there's, there's like an attempt at a love triangle in here, but it's pretty obvious that one side of it is crumbling into dust before it's even begun. And I think if Ali Condi had crafted the love triangle a bit better and had not gone with the insta-love aspect, if it was still kind of a hesitant, like, I want to be loyal to the society because that's what I've been bred and grown up and brought up to do, but it all kind of falls apart. So two and a half stars for this one, um, even though it is a very interesting premise. There were some twists and turns I saw them all come in, probably because as I said, like I grew up reading dystopians, so this isn't anything new for me. Um, I am gonna be reading the rest of the series in March, probably. Uh, I've put them on my TBR, I'll link that down in the description, but I'm not feeling it. Like, as soon as I finished this, I was like, I'll just binge the rest of the series, just get it out of the way. But now I've had, like, a week off. I'm like, oh, do I really need to read any more of them? So I think this is one that if you haven't read a lot of dystopian, you might enjoy it. And if you like stories where there is more of an insta-love aspect, it's going to be perfect for you. Um, but yeah, I'm just not a huge fan of Cassia as a character. She's quite annoying and also not a huge fan of the relationships so two and a half stars for this one like it's exactly in the middle like, I'm completely neutral on it but it doesn't feel like a three star it feels like less than that so that's why I was like mm, two and a half so yeah not not the one but enjoyable enough because it was quick on the bright side the next book I'd like to talk about was our first five star of the year and that was A Tangle of Spells by Michelle Harrison and um, so this is the last book in the Pinch of Magic series which follows the Wadishan sisters in this book they move away from the island of Crowstone and they move to a new location with their dad and their grandmother and when they settle in they realize that there are coins in the corners of the rooms and there's salt over all of the doors and all of the windows and if you've seen Supernatural you know that salt blocking entrances means bad shit's gonna go down and even though this is a middle grade I find myself feeling genuinely unsettled like there are such spooky creepy moments in this one that I could feel like the shivers running down my spine and I love that and I think Michelle Harrison has such a way with words especially the way that she crafts her magic systems and the, the, the characters are all brilliant and the world especially like I hope that she writes more stories in this world even if she doesn't particularly specifically follow the Buddhist and sisters I don't want this to be the end because this was my favorite out of all of them I really enjoyed a pinch of magic I was a little less enamored with a sprinkle of sorcery I'm not quite sure why but there was just something in that one that didn't quite click with me but a tango of spells was like eating chocolate 
when I started, I couldn't stop. Um, I thought this was going to take a few days, both A Pinch of Magic and A Sprinkle of Sorcery. It's been quite slow reading because I haven't been completely drawn in. But with this one, we were like three quarters of the way through it and it felt like we'd only just started it. That is how easy it is to read this book and how enjoyable it is. And I think Sean summed it up perfectly. He said it didn't feel like a British and Sisters book. It feels like Michelle Harrison because she has such a distinctive writing style. She feels like reading classic children's literature even though it's being published now um especially because her settings are a bit kind of they feel more historical even though they are obviously fantastical settings um but he summed it up perfectly it doesn't feel like a pinch of magic story and i loved that about it uh, i don't know it was like the perfect storm for me um i've had a couple of disappointing reads and a couple of books that weren't really interesting me and then we picked this up and it was just just perfect and I'm already kind of thinking about rereading the rest of the series to see whether that same spark will be there. If this was just the one that it needed to like click my love for Michelle Harrison into full gear. <laughs> but yes, um, definitely worth picking up. So glad that I pre-ordered this and I'm so glad that I read these books because they really are brilliant. Now I've had a five star this year. That's really good. So we might as well just bring the mood down. The DNF. It was called The Dead Days Journal. It was by someone called Sandra Mitchell. And it was awful. End of the world. Post-apocalyptic. Uh, it sounded like it was going to be a survivalist kind of thriller. It turns out there's actually like vampires and other like supernatural creatures in it. it. wasn't what I signed up for. Which was one of the major reasons that I DNF'd. Because I just wasn't interested in that kind of story. But also, the girl gets it. <coughs> She's halfway through sex. And her boyfriend carries on when she tells him to stop. And then he tells her dad, he goes to her father and is like, your daughter won't have sex with me. And her dad's like, right, she doesn't want to repopulate the planet. I'm going to have to arrange for her to get rid. <coughs> what? How did this get published? I don't know if it is independently published. I don't know if it is a small press published book, but it should not exist. And I was disgusted by it. And even though it was a review copy, and even though normally with my review copies, even if I'm really not enjoying it, I force my way through, I got to 25% and I could not with this one. I was so angry. Not only that, the writing was very bland. The characters, there's lots and lots of named characters, but you don't actually get any descriptions or personality traits from them. So it's a populated world that feels like you're just surrounded by cardboard cutouts. Not good. So this one... Uh, bye bye. What, what a letdown. I didn't want to be DNFing a book a month, but I just couldn't physically get through this one. Like, I got to that bit and I just felt such rage. It kind of felt like the Suki Stackhouse book. If somebody was trying to make it edgier and didn't really know what they were doing, I'd rather just read another Suki Stackhouse book. And I didn't even really like the first one that much. The next book I'd like to talk about is The List by Patricia Forge. This is another dystopian novel. In this world, there is a list of 500 words that people are allowed to use, and those are the only words that they are allowed to use. And our main character, Letta, is a wordsmith, and so she knows all of the other words that have been taken out of use, and she's allowed to speak the way that we do, rather than just speaking in lists. But her mentor goes searching for more words because for some reason they have to leave their little compound to go out and find words on things to then bring them back and catalogue them so that they can then be destroyed because they aren't list words which I didn't really get the logic there um but Letta thinks that he's dead and she ends up becoming instead of just being the wordsmith's apprentice she is the wordsmith and she gets involved with someone who's like an outcast and he's basically trying to get her to turn against the society and overthrow it and bring words back to people this is one that it had a brilliant concept but it was just a really poor execution i think what i'd been expecting and i probably shouldn't have expected it because it is just a way novel I'd been expecting it to be written in more of like a literary fiction way where the narrative would also be told in a list and that was naive of me because it's just a normal novel with letters vocabulary and letters um dialogue 
being written normally. And then the background characters are speaking in lists. So their dialogue is very stilted, it's very disconnected, it's very jarring. But I'd been expecting that from the whole story. And I thought maybe letters, dialogue would be the only bits that would be written freely. So you would have that contrast of like, okay, what would really, like, what would it really feel like if we were only allowed to use 500 words? If you're writing a novel and you've got like this list of 500 words that you're allowed to use and you have to describe things, like you have to describe around things because you've taken that word out of use. But it wasn't like that. And then also the villagers could like come and request extra boxes of words based off of what skills they had. So if somebody was a medicine person, they could come and request like medical words. If someone was a bricklayer, they could come and request building words. So it wasn't really 500 words anyway. There were a lot of little loopholes and plot holes with it that I didn't really understand. And it wasn't until I was about halfway through that I was like looking up on Goodreads and seeing what other people were thinking because I was like maybe there's just something I'm missing with this one and then I realised it had a sequel and I thought it was going to be a standalone and it doesn't feel like it needs a sequel because you get to the end and you're like wow I have no reason to carry on with this story because it's wrapped up so neatly. I can imagine what the sequel's going to do because there are some kind of breadcrumbs they throw out but I'm not interested at all in carrying on with the series because it was just god it was like stale toast it was just very very boring and hard to get through which i hate saying because again the premise is amazing like for a dystopian especially this has such a unique premise but i just didn't like the way that it was written which is sucky um i actually had this written down as a three star before i started writing this review but i know i liked it less than matched and matched was a 2.5 star and i still felt fixed on having matched a 2.5 so the list got dropped down um sorry yeah i probably should have dnf'd this one this was one that sean dnf we were reading it together and he got like halfway through and was like i'm too bored i can't carry on and then he asked how it was going he waited until i'd read like another 40 percent, and then he's like how's it going and i'm like nothing has happened he's like there's no way you've read 40 percent of this book and nothing has happened and i'm like okay well she thought this had happened and then she found out this hadn't happened and he's like oh is that literally all yeah nothing nothing happens in this book at all it is so long for a book that has no content <laughs> not 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 a recommended one the next book i'd like to talk about is give people money by annie lyrie this one i gave four stars to it does what it says on the tin it's a non-fiction book investigating the uh idea of universal basic income and looking at the way that it has been implemented in countries around the world where they've been doing pilot studies regarding whether a universal basic income would be something feasible it was published in 2016 so it's a few years out of date i would be really interested in reading more about this subject so if you have read any books that do talk about UBI and are more recent it would definitely be something I'd be interested in picking up uh, I think the concept is fascinating and the way that Annie Lowry has done this research and travelled across the globe you get to see um, pilot studies in India in uh, South Korea in Nigeria you really do travel all around the globe looking at the idea of universal basic income and it is fascinating um, I just wish I'd read it when it came out rather than waiting until it was five years out of date because non-fiction ages so quickly which is a shame the next book i'd like to talk about is a short story and that is the pill by meg ellison this follows a fat girl whose mother is obsessed with taking part in medical studies and she starts taking this pill that makes her skinny 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 and she bullies me the she bullies the um main character's fa father and brother into taking part in this study and she's trying to bully the main character into taking part in the study as well it's a fascinating premise and i think i liked the way it was written but i'm still a bit conflicted on this one my knee-jerk response was to give it four stars because i think that the way that it talks about society's reaction to fat people and the way that society views fat people is fascinating and the idea of this pill that like you take it and then you end up like defecating half of your body mass 
and it's like fat cells and skin cells so you don't have to have like tucks and lifts and things it all just goes and you just shrink 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 and it's a fascinating concept I think if I'd been in a bad place with my eating it would have been the kind of thing that would have pushed me over the edge so I am glad that I'm in a better place mentally at the moment to read this short story it, it was free online when I read it it was only going to be up for a couple of weeks if it is still up when this video goes live I will link it down in the description for you so that you can make up your own mind on this one but yeah I think it was like 25 pages it was very very short um but definitely makes me interested in reading more of Meg Ellison's writing in the future because she has a very straightforward approach to the way that society views fat people and that's something that I'd be interested in reading more about and I then have two books to talk to you about that I actually listened to on audiobook um so these are after we had our we after I had my dental surgery we couldn't finish reading The Vanishing Half so we just grabbed a couple of audiobooks off of the library app and listened to them the first one of those was How the King of Elfheim Learned to Hate Stories by Holly Black this is the 3.5 in the Folk of the Air series so it follows the Queen of Nothing but some of the stories are actually set before the series and during the series and my main complaint with this one is that I just don't think it's necessary I said it three stars I liked some of the stories but I feel like they could have been in the Folk of the Air series it didn't need to be an extra book by itself I can see why Holly Black chose to release these stories separately because number one money 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 and number two it would involve taking a step back from Jude's perspective and going into Carlton's head and I think if we'd had the Folk of the Earth series as a dual perspective series it would have been more interesting for me um, because I do find it kind of one dimensional at points oh god this is a not controversial opinion because people love this series but yeah i just i find it, it i don't find it completely engaging all the time because i think there are so many plot points that rely on the characters deceiving each other and the miscommunication between them and that's just not a favorite trope of mine it never will be and it never has been um i think miscommunication is just one of the cheapest ways to tell a story because in reality characters would learn to communicate quicker than Jude and Carlin do and I think if if it was a dual perspective novel you would know every time they were deceiving each other and every time that they were miscommunicating so a lot of the plot points would fall apart because you would be able to see the twists and turns coming because you would be in both characters heads so I can understand why these stories weren't part of the original series but it also just kind of makes me wish that the Folk of the Air series was written from Carlton's perspective because he's such a more interesting character to read from. I love his sarcasm, I've always really liked him as a character and even though I wasn't a huge fan of the way that the series ended, I did get excited when this was announced and I was looking forward to this because I thought it would add a lot more to the story but in reality it doesn't which kind of sucks it's very very short this was a two hour audiobook i think it was like 11 short stories but there's one short story that's told over and over again um it's told with like a different twist on each time so it's like the way that the moral in the tale changes but that got very repetitive and boring because it's like well i've just listened to this and i don't really care there was a scene between lock nikasia and carbon that i thought was superb i thought that the way that the characters interacted and the way that it shone a light on the kind of connections between them in the main series was just brilliant i love that there's also a couple of scenes set after the end of the queen of nothing so you get to see these characters after everything's gone down and when they're kind of moving on with their lives i love that i would have happily just read seven or eight short stories of just Jude and Cardam being happy in the future like honestly I like these characters and even if it wasn't the most interesting even if it didn't have like drama or twists and turns I'd just happily read them like having dinner together every so often you know and I think I like these characters but 
I'm not a fan of Holly Black's writing style and I don't think she is the author for me and I think I need to just come to terms with that and accept it because I keep reading her books thinking this is going to be the one that's going to make it click, this is going to be the one that I'm finally going to love and it never is and yeah so not the book for me. If you're a huge fan of the Faux Pierre series I would recommend this one because it's again as I said very very quick and very short and it's a nice easy one to get through but not not for me which is a shame and the last book that i'd like to talk about in this video is miss peregrine's home for peculiar children by ransom ricks and this was a four star and i was tempted to give it more if i'm honest it's not quite a five star for me because there are some like little plot holes and things that i didn't really enjoy but no, I don't know if it was the narrator but I just was so intrigued by this world and I was so intrigued by this story and I was gripped throughout. Um, the first half especially is very very easy to get through. So you're following a boy whose granddad is killed and he finds his body and there's like a monster over his body and he obviously tries to tell people. I'm really sorry if you can hear Ezra by the way, Sean's got him upstairs, he's trying to go to sleep, he won't let himself so it, he's progressively getting louder but yes um he tries to tell people but obviously nobody believes him because it's monsters and there's no way a monster's killed your granddad um but then he decides to go to wales which is where his granddad stayed at a children's home and he decides to investigate his granddad's past um and he comes across this home for peculiar children so the home is actually stuck in what is described as a loot so it's set in 1940 so he goes through this tunnel in the modern day and he comes out and it's september the 3rd 1940 and these children have been in there for like 70 years um so it's kind of like a historical novel in some ways like there's um sci-fi aspects there's fancy aspects there's supernatural aspects but like at its heart i'd kind of say it was historical because you spend a lot more time back then so you've got the disconnect from technology and you've got the threat of the war and yeah it just it definitely has like historical vibes i think that's also helped by the fact that throughout there are pictures of all of the kind of people oh there's also like the chapter headings but yeah there's all the like people throughout um and the old style photographs um so this definitely does give off a historical vibe. The only reason that I'm not giving it five stars is because there's a... Oh, the screaming is getting loud. The only reason I'm not giving this on five stars is because there is quite a bit of an info dump. Like, when they first kind of get to the home, uh, Miss Peregrine sits down and is like, hey, uh, this is what's going on here. This is who we are. This is other stuff about our world. And even though when we were listening to the audiobook, I was still reading along and I still just didn't really understand what was going on. So there are things called hollows that can turn into whites, but then the whites have to feed the other hollows and the hollows eat peculiar children. But if they eat too many, they turn into a white, but then they're no longer peculiars because they're, they've been eaten. I, I honestly have no idea what was going on. But then there's like, the hollow is the monster thing that kills his granddad. But then the white needs to hunt for the hollow. So how does the hollow kill his granddad if it needs a white to hunt for it so that it's able to feed? I, I don't really. It's been like three or four days since we finished this and I'm still completely baffled by that. And I said to Sean, I would have liked it more if this had been a shorter book, just kind of focusing on the peculiar children and the home and the history. And then slowly, slowly introducing the other aspects like, ooh, there are things called hollows, but we can't tell you about those because those are too scary because we're like still children at heart, even though we've been stuck here for 80 years. Um, it might have helped my head get around it a bit better. I don't know if I'm just stupid <laughs> because like it shouldn't be that hard to understand. And I'm wondering because the second book's called Hollow City, so I'm assuming there's going to be a lot more of a focus on the hollows. So I'm hoping that they'll break it down a bit more and I'll be able to follow it a bit more because I was so absorbed by this story in this world until all of that happened and then my brain just felt like it was constantly racing and struggling to try and keep up 
and it threw me out a little bit. But yeah, I'm interested in carrying on with Jacob's story. And I'm interested in seeing the rest of the Peculiar Children again. I'm wondering whether they might meet more Peculiar Children in the future, especially knowing that there is another five books after this one. It wasn't just the trilogy. Um, but I'm glad I finally read this one because this was on my 25 before 25 list and I didn't think I was going to get to it before my birthday. But I have. And yeah, very, very good audiobook narrator. So if you aren't somebody who listens to audiobooks a lot, this is one that is very engaging. And so yeah, that's all the books that we read in February. Those are the 10 that we read in the second half. If you would like to see our reviews of Gemina, Obsidio, The Perfect Girlfriend by Karen Hamilton, Rules for Being a Girl by Candice Bushnell and Katie Katugno, It Was Her by Mark Hill, and Don't Ask Me Where I'm From by Jennifer Dillion, then you can check those out in our February mid-month wrap-up because I spoke about those at length earlier in the month. But yes, I'm sorry this video was so long, I tried to do it as quickly as I could and apparently I still had too much to say, but it was also 11 books, so I think that's allowed. Um, if you like this video, please give it a like, and if you would like to subscribe, you'd be really, really grateful. We normally post videos every Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday, but because it is World Book Day week, we are posting a video every day this week. Um, so please pop back tomorrow to see what we are getting up to, and we will see you then. Bye! I've forgotten her name. I was going to say Meg, but that's the author's name.